Hi, everybody. My name is Tracy Dusablon, and I am the president of the Arizona chapter of RC. Uh, the American Research Center in Egypt was established 73 years ago in Boston in 1948. They support an antiquities endowment fund, which awards grants to help support the work of documenting and preserving Egypt's cultural heritage as well as supporting research members projects, which help with educational and research institutions that participate in the governance of RC and represent major expedition interests in Egypt. Um, if you're interested in joining our organization, we'd love to have you. And we invite you to join by visiting rc.org. So today's lecture, um, we will be having an online lecture presented by Luke Addison, who is our chapter's treasurer. He will be speaking about the conservation of the 2100 BCE Egyptian coffin of Nacht. After the lecture, you're very welcome to ask questions of Luke in regard to his presentation. You may type them into the chat box with a cue before your question, and our vice president, Leah Humphrey, We'll be happy to read them to Luke for him to answer. Right now, I would like to turn the lecture over to Luke. Welcome, Luke. Great, thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, can everybody see that okay? Wonderful. Excellent, okay. To get this started, uh, I didn't do this project myself. I had a lot of people who helped me uh, along the way. Um, most of all, Dr. Nancy Odegaard was my partner in this project and was absolutely instrumental to every piece of it. Uh, and a few other friends who are actually here tonight, Chris Rudis was also instrumental to this project. So a big thank you to both of them. Uh, before we get going, just a word on the provenance. Uh, the, the provenance for this piece was extensively researched before conservation treatment began, uh, mainly by some uh, Egyptian antiquities ministry officials, uh, then by RC itself before uh, giving grant funding for this project, and by Dr. Odegaard and myself to make sure uh, everything was above board before we even uh, touched the piece. It might seem odd to have an Egyptian coffin at the University of Arizona, um, but, but once you look at the university structure, it, it, it's not too weird. There, there's a, a very good Egyptology program. And uh, Dr. Pierce Paul Kresman, who was at the university at the time, uh, was working with the Institute of Archaeological Research and Discovery, uh, who had acquired this coffin and brought it to the U of A uh, for treatment. Uh, he had initially asked Dr. Odegaard if, if she would be able to, to treat the coffin or might know someone uh, who could, and that's how I got involved in this project. Uh, due to the this, this sensitive nature of funerary objects, Dr. Odegaard thought it, it might be best if I performed the conservation treatment in my private studio uh, away from the Arizona State Museum's conservation laboratory, which is quite a public laboratory. You can look into it from the gallery. There are often visitors there, so we thought it would actually just be much easier uh, if we did this treatment uh, in my own studio. As a general background for this project, um, the ARD requested essentially a technical study so we can understand what the materials were. And then once we understood what the materials were, then we could proceed with treatment. A basic visual analysis showed us several things. Uh, first, by microscopy, we identified several different wood species. Two of them were tamarisk and acacia. Another was identified by eye, and that was sycamore fig, which uh, you know many of you being e Egyptology enthusiasts or even experts are well aware of sycamore fig's uh, significance in Egyptian artifacts. Uh, the coffin itself was believed to, to uh, come from around 2100 BCE or so. Um, the wood itself for that predicted age uh, was in very good condition. Uh, the paint itself was also in very good condition. It was almost unbelievably good. And so, you know, one of the project goals became uh, 
one of the project goals became identifying the authenticity of, of the materials, making sure that everything that we're looking at is actually original to the coffin. You know, you might look at the Wajad eyes and see, you know, how bright that white is and how you know deep that black is. Sometimes when you see that, you know, as a conservator, some red flags might go off in the back of your head saying this is supposed to be 4,000 years old and you have these vibrant colors. You know, you might want to look a little further into that. So we partook on a technical study to understand what we were working with and then proceed with treatment. So it's really a two part project. Uh, this is just a really beautiful three quarters view uh, of the coffin. So you can see the foot end here, which is towards the left of the screen and towards the right of the screen is, is the head end of the coffin and the front. So one of the first things that we did, uh, you know, to start getting an idea of what we were working with, to start to get an idea of the authenticity of the materials, uh, was we undertook radiocarbon dating. And a good friend of ours, Dr. Greg Hodgins at the University of Arizona's Accelerator, Accelerator Mass Spectrometry Laboratory uh, guided the sampling for this process. We wanted to be very careful and very discreet with the samples that we took. Uh, using the accelerator mass spectrometer, we were actually able to take very small samples around the, uh, the order of 50 milligrams for wood and for textiles around five milligrams or so. These are very small samples that we took. And in all cases, we actually took them from hidden areas within the coffin. So actually the, the sites that we sampled are not visible. So we weren't uh, interrupting the, you know, anything uh, that would, would cause aesthetic issues with the coffin or anything that might disrupt the hieroglyphs or any of the other um, painted decoration. Um, the, the textile that we found uh, in the coffin, it was actually in, uh, adhered to the interior wall of the coffin where the body of the person who was interred in it had slumped backwards towards the back of the coffin over time. And the mummy wrapping, uh, due to the resins and some other organic materials, eventually became adhered to the, to the wall of the coffin, that interior. And when the mummy was removed, it, looks, it looked as though that mummy wrapping that was attached there uh, ripped off and actually stayed behind. So we thought this was a brilliant opportunity to radiocarbon date both the wood and the textile, uh, which we hadn't actually seen before. So that was a wonderful first for, for all of us involved in the project. All of those samples underwent uh, what's called ABA pretreatment or acid-base acid pretreatment to remove any kind of contaminants that would throw off our radiocarbon dates. And the textile itself actually first underwent acetone soxalate extraction, which is a fancy way of saying you soaked it in acetone for a long time to remove any kind of resins or oils that might have been left behind to make sure that those also weren't uh, giving you an inaccurate radiocarbon date. Once that's done, that also then goes through an acid-base acid pretreatment, which re removes a lot of, you know, carbonaceous materials, things that you don't want, you know, in your sample. Once we actually tested these, you know, I went through, I did the treatment, we extracted um, the CO2 uh, via pyrolysis, and then the ASM lab took that over, um, made the pucks that go into the accelerated mass spectrometer, and shot them through the accelerated mass spectrometer and we ended up with our radiocarbon dates. And at the end of that, what we found is that the textile and the wood not only matched the predicted date of the coffin, but they had an almost perfect overlap to about a 95% probability that they belonged to around 2100 BCE. And they also matched the ages of each other, which was really important. And so that tells us a few things. Now, one is that the textile that was adhered to the coffin wall in the interior was over the preparation layer that we see throughout the coffin, this calcium carbonate preparation layer. So with that textile on top of it, we can make a pretty good guess that that plaster was in place before the textile was adhered to it. So we have a, a, a pretty early date, pretty, po pretty early possible date for the coffin being around 2100 BCE. Of course, you can always apply an old text to the interior of a coffin, but that, that's not too likely in this situation. So here in this screen, you can actually see in the top left the three wood sample or the two wood samples and the one textile sample. They're very small. And in the bottom left, you can actually see that textile fragment and that's adhered to the interior. And you can see it looks it looks to be something like linen, which would be very common for the period. Uh, and one thing that's very interesting about linen in the period is that it was, you know, it was harvested seasonally and often didn't last too long. So you can be pretty 
comfortable to, you know, knowing that that linen is actually belonging to pretty close within those dates that you radiocarbon date it to. It, it probably wasn't around for 100 years or 200 years, you know, maybe had a lifetime of 30 years or something like that. So when you get that radiocarbon date for the, the linen textile, you know you've, you've narrowed that date range down a bit. Whereas with a piece of wood, you can sometimes have very large date ranges depending on where you take the sample from. You know, one of these trees that grow in Egypt could be 200 years old before it's harvested. And if you take your sample from the interior of the tree, well, now your date is off by 200 years. So we were very careful in our sample selection, but we also kind of gave ourselves, you know, a little bit of security by using that textile so we can get a really good idea of what the actual manufacture date of the coffin is. And we're going to skip over uh, the, the chart on the right hand side. That's our radiocarbon date. And if anyone took st statistics and you're having flashbacks in the bottom right corner, that, that binomial distribution, we're just going to skip right over that. That is just showing us that we have a 95% probability that it belongs to this particular time period. So once we started to get an idea of you know the age of these materials, we're starting to feel confident that this actually belongs to the period, uh, underwent a really extensive visual analysis of the coffin to identify what materials are original to the coffin and what materials are not, which is very important. This coffin in particular had some very tricky things going on with the joinery and the dowels and things like that. So uh, one of the things that we did was use uh, UV vis light to identify different types of adhesives and binders and things like that. And one thing that we found was that in the interior of each of the joints of the coffin, that's where the, you know two pieces of wood meet. What we found is that there were actually modern maple dowels in the corners adhered with what's called a PVAC, a polyvinyl acetate emulsion adhesive or what we normally call it, yellow carpenter's glue. Certainly not a 2000 BC uh, technology. So you know that that happens sometime later. And also the PBAC gives you a really good clue. You know, that's that really became popular in the early 20th century, much more popular towards the middle of the 20th century. So it really lets you kind of know when that repair occurred. We also noticed uh, something that, that really stuck out uh, with the coffin, and that was the fact that it had actually been sawed in half at some point, and we'll look at that on another slide. And then it was repaired with an epoxy-like material. So, you know, it's, it comes pretty obvious when you're looking at these materials, you have to distinguish between what is possibly original and what possibly isn't original. And so here you can see that cross cut. You can see, if you can see my mouse, uh, where the tone of the orange yellow paint changes right here in this line and you can kind of see a crack going through the length of it on the here on the right side, you can see that a little more closely. So what we wanted to check to see was if this paint here, which is over a modern repair matches this paint here, which we believe to believe to be authentic. So if these two paints matched chemically, if they if they had the same chemical composition, then we would know that this paint could not be original to the coffin. So that was one of the tests that we we undertook. So there are a couple different ways you can look at that. One of them is through uh, portable x-ray fluorescence or just regular x-ray fluorescence. We're lucky to have this uh, portable instrument. And here's uh, Gina Watkinson, who's a wonderful conservator at the Arizona State Museum Conservation Laboratory, performing that analysis. And we did that in many different locations. I believe it was around 30 or so testing all the different pigment types and uh, you know not only just the different pigment types but different pigment types in different locations so we make sure uh, you know each one of these materials has you know a very distinct chemical composition we can identify that in several locations and that builds the confidence that that material is either original or not in the coffin so we uh, we looked at the, the paint we looked at what we thought were repair materials we looked at the preparation layer if it was on the coffin we looked at it another technique that we can use is ftir which is fourier transform infrared spectroscopy spectroscopy and we use you know this thing called the atr motor the attenuated total reflectance that's this here in the bottom right corner where you can just load a sample directly into this instrument but essentially what it lets us do is take a sample and look at a spectrum of its chemical composition and use what are called the functional groups of the chemical compound to match it to other spectra and identify what the material actually consists of. And this is especially useful for organic materials like binding media 
resins, oils, proteins, things like that. This instrument is really useful in giving us that information. One thing that we did with this coffin is uh, we actually went through and collected a lot of samples that had actually fallen off as debris. Um, that was debris from transportation in the coffin. You know, it, it came from York, Europe to the United States. So there had been some material that had fallen off. So instead of taking a lot of samples from the coffin itself and removing more material, we actually collected almost all of it uh, right off of the platform that the coffin was on. In a few locations, it was necessary to take very small samples, which were essentially particles the size of a pinhead from different locations because we needed to make sure we knew this particular paint came from this particular era area. So we know exactly where that sample came from when we go to test it. So here I was taking a, a sample of this Egyptian blue paint, what we thought was Egyptian blue paint with a, a Glover's needle, which is a very small needle and get a very fine sample, which you can see in the bottom right corner there. It's essentially about the size of the tip of a pencil or something like that. When we looked uh, at all these samples, with the FTIR and the PXRF, we were able to match all the chemical compositions to reported compositions that exist in, in the literature, the technical literature, that report all these chemical compositions of authentic objects. So we were able to identify all of these paints as matching chemically perfectly all of these paints that we know to be authentic, except for a few of them. One thing that we saw when we were looking at these paints, and one thing that's very tricky about identifying binding media in these paints, is that it, you know it it tends to wash out over time. It tends to crystallize or dissolve. So when you're trying to identify binding media in paints, it's a very difficult thing to do. So when we were looking at all these paint samples, we kept noticing this trend that we weren't seeing any peaks for oils or resins or waxes or proteins or anything. In two paint sample types in the red and the blue pigment, we saw what looked like could be uh, what were called uh, amine stretches or amine wags, where you see CN or NH wags in the spectrum, uh, which could possibly indicate a protein. So we saw kind of the ghost of that in the spectrum, but nothing that could be conclusive. So once we started piecing together, together this evidence, we could start to, to think about treatment and further identification. So uh, here's where we mapped out each sample location, um, being very careful to mark exactly where we took each sample from. Uh, on the right side is Wendy Lindsay, who was with the, the Arizona State Museum Conservation Lab at the time. We spent many days in a, the, the dark room with the FTIR looking at spectra and analyzing all of these materials. And what we found was that all of the materials we essentially thought to be original were very likely to be original. They match all the chemical compositions very nicely. We saw that the preparation layer was a calcium carbonate preparation layer. That's that white material, or sometimes people call it gesso, that all the paints are on top of. We saw that that was pure calcium carbonate. We saw that the, the yellow, that dark yellow orange color was an iron-based yellow ochre. The red was a red-based iron ochre. The blue was in fact Egyptian blue. The white was a really fine, the, the white in the eyes was a really finely ground calcium carbonate. And the black was a carbon based black, which means that it came from combustion, it came from a fire, it wasn't a soot black or something like that. So, which, which is also very traditional in the Egyptian funerary palette of paints. And then the, the light yellow of the coffin we found was actually a mixture of that darker yellow and the white calcium carbonate to make a very light, kind of cream colored yellow. And so you can see here some of these spectra and you can see, you know, um, what our samples were versus what the known spectra is. So in red, we have our samples in blue. We have known spectra that we're matching these against. So you can see how nicely they match to the, the, the known standards. Now, what we we did find uh, with the materials that we thought were not original, you know, the materials from the, those cross cuts the material from uh, the adhesive from those dowels we found, you know, all of course were either, you know, epoxy for that cross cut adhesive, some kind of polyvinyl acetate emulsion for that wood dowel. Um, we also found modern adhesives in, in between the joins that you, you, you see a lot of cracks in the coffin. So at some point there was actually pretty extensive restoration effort or repair effort with this coffin where someone was using uh, carpenter's glue or something like that pretty extensively throughout it to glue all the pieces back together. Uh, we also saw that the red, uh, brown, and yellow overpaint that was over those epoxy fills that we were kind of comparing to the other paint, they all had a lot of barium in them and a lot of other chemical uh, 
elements that didn't match the other paints that we thought were original. So using the FTAR, using the PXRF, we were able to look at those and distinguish them from the other materials and show that those paints that we thought were not original were not original to it. Once we knew that, uh, then it was time to start identifying some of the uh, soiling materials or de deterioration products. Uh, one of the things uh, that's very common in these types of objects are salts. And it's quite important to identify what kind of salt you have so that you can design a treatment methodology for it. And what we found pretty extensively throughout the coffin was that the, uh, the salt content were essentially sulfate salts and mostly sodium sulfate salts. Um, what that ends up telling us is that we can use a water-based cleaning system to remove uh, those types of salts. And you can see on the right-hand side, one of the ways we test that are with these little uh, test strips. And so on the left, you can see how the color is quite different from the strip on the right. So the right-hand side is an unused test strip. The left-hand side is the used test strip. And you can see how the color changes when it changes when it comes in contact with a, a sulfate material. So that was one of the ways that we identified uh, that material. That leads us directly into this book, which is an invaluable, uh, written by Dr. Odegaard and her colleagues, which is a material characterization test for objects of art and archaeology. We use this book to attack the problem of the binding media. Uh, the binding media was, was paramount to identify because identifying the binding media then allowed us to design a plan for cleaning as well as consolidation or stabilization of the material. So, you know, when we got the coffin, the paint in many areas was essentially flaking off. It was very unstable. Um, you know, essentially walking by it, a, a breeze would cause paint to fly off of the coffin. So we had to identify a way to re-adhere the paint to the coffin. And to do that, you have to know what the binding media is. You know, if you start cleaning something without knowing that, that information, you could, can cause irreparable harm to it by using an inappropriate solvent system or something like that. So we used this book to attack that question because our instrumental analysis was inconclusive. So uh, there were essentially 40 tests that were performed. It was several weeks of work in the lab. And I think I drove everyone in the lab crazy with all of these tests. Um, but each sample had to be tested uh, with each one of these tests. So it was just a, a huge amount of testing that went into this. And luckily, like we said, you know, at the beginning, we were able to collect a lot of these samples as detached debris, and they're very small samples, which is one thing that's great about this book is that it was actually designed specifically for this. So you can use those very small samples in these material characterization tests to get really good results. So we didn't need a lot of material to actually do all of these tests. So I've just listed some of the tests here. You know, we went through when we were looking for things like carbohydrates, rosins, starches, waxes, things that you would see, you know, in traditional Egyptian technology, things like beeswax or rosin from a tree or even some type of lac or something like that. Now, we didn't see any of that in any of the samples. Uh, finally, kind of at our my wit's end, I did the, the lead acetate uh, test, which is a test for proteins or proteinaceous binding media. That's significant because in Egypt at the time, um, glue was just really starting to come into use. It wasn't used so much throughout the Old Kingdom, but in the Middle Kingdom, uh, animal-based protein glues became more common. And we saw earlier with the FTIR that a few uh, paint samples had those amine wags and stretches. So it was it kind of indicated that there might be a, a protein there. We we remembered that you know really late in the in the process of doing these material characterization tests. So I did all the tests and, you know, we didn't get any results with any of them. So, you know, that kind of sends up a red flag because the paint has to be bound somehow. So there has to be something holding all of that paint together. You can't just have, you know, dry pigment resting on that surface with this kind of coverage and that kind of thickness. Um, so essentially what we did was take this test and modify it. So you can see that the size of the tube here, it's quite large that we're doing the test in here that's undergoing the pyrolysis. You can see my finger there on the right hand side. This is how we modified it to increase uh, the volume of sulfides that would evolve during pyrolysis. And instead of increasing sample size, what we did was decrease the total volume of the container 
which increases total concentration within that container. So that lets us use this very small amount of sample. You can see, you know, my, my hands aren't that big. You can see the wrinkles on my fingers and how small those sample sizes are, which is really one of the kind of the beauty of this test. So doing that by reducing the volume of that container and performing this lead acetate and pyrolysis test, we were actually able to identify an animal protein binding media within that paint, which is, was just absolutely, you know, a phenomenal revelation. It, takes maybe $3 worth of materials to perform this test. Um, compare that to, you know, sometimes $300, $400, $500 or $500 per instrumental test, and it really becomes quite apparent, you know, how cost effective this kind of thing is, especially when you look at the fact that the instruments weren't able to identify the protein binder. So this was really, you know, a, a wonderful thing that we found throughout through the process uh, of our technical study. So a little bit of the chemistry behind that. Um, essentially what happens is that within uh, protein glues, within any protein, there are amino acids that contain uh, sulfur, sulfur functional groups. When they undergo pyrolysis, what evolves in, in essentially a gas phase are sulfides. In the lead acetate test strip, the sulfide reacts with the lead and it forms this kind of brownish black precipitate, which is essentially just a solid uh, within the test strip. So you can actually visibly see the test strip changing color. And on the right side, you can see what, lead, uh, what the, the, the lead sulfide looks like. It's this brown black color. And once pyrolysis occurs, as, as soon as you, you remove that test strip from the container, you can put that under a microscope and look at it and see if you have any of these brown black dots on your test strip. Now, one thing that you have to be careful of because this is undergoing pyrolysis uh, is that you want to make sure you didn't just burn your test paper, which does happen. So what you do after that is you use hydrogen peroxide to confirm that you could actually form lead sulfide and didn't just burn your paper. So if your hydrogen peroxide takes your, your brown black lead sulfide and turns it into lead sulfate, which is white, so you have a transition from brown black to white, then it confirms that you could actually form the lead sulfide in that test strip. So the, the chemistry in here is actually not very complex to look at, but it's actually you know, brilliantly, uh, uh, it's, it's just absolutely phenomenal chemistry that's occurring inside this little capillary tube. What happens is that you go from lead acetate, which is essentially colorless, and when the sulfide interacts with it, it bonds to that lead, and essentially due to things like molecular over, over, orbital overlap and things like that, it forms uh, what's called a band gap, and it's a 0.4 electron volt band gap, which actually makes this material a semiconductor, which means that that's actually what causes this to go brown black in color. Um, so the chemistry here is actually very important. So the color is the indicator here that you're looking for. And then the hydrogen peroxide that removes that color is the confirmation of the test. So it's a very effective, effective reliable test that you can have a lot of confidence in. So after all of that testing, what we were able to arrive at is that the radiocarbon dates all belong to the period. All of the material compositions match materials that are uh, that date to that period. Um, and all the materials that we identify as restoration materials or repair materials don't. So we can be pretty confident in saying that this is actually an authentic object uh, from that time period, which was one of the goals at the beginning of this project. So halfway through the technical, or through, you know, almost all the way through the technical study, we were able to achieve that goal and determine that this coffin was actually completely original, except for those few little bits and pieces that were repairs. So going into the actual conservation treatment of this, um, I had to show this one picture here uh, inside that blue box. If, if, if anyone reads hieroglyphs, uh, you can see if that's actually Knox's name here, which I thought it's always important to say the person's name when you're, when you're talking about their funerary object. Uh, so once we had identified all the materials and characterized them, then it was time to design a, a treatment plan. So we consulted with uh, many other conservators. Uh, primarily, it was Chris DeVrutis, Renee Stein, and Michaela Paulson, who were absolutely fundamental to designing the cleaning treatments. Uh, what we ended up that what we ended up at was using the modular cleaning program to design an aqueous system or a water-based cleaning system. And uh, Michaela Paulson had recommended this material called Evalon CR, which we'll look at a little bit later. 
And then all of them had recommended this other material called cyclomethacone D5, which was really essential in treating this in treating uh, the matte paint. So we had a lot of different cleaning objectives. And uh, you know, since this is more of an Egyptology talk than a, a pure conservation science talk, we'll we'll brush through some of this a little bit. But you know, you'll notice here that, that on the right hand side, this is actually you know what the coffin looked like originally. This was the lid. And you can see how disfiguring all of that water damage is and all of those white salts that are there on the surface. We wanted to design a treatment plan that would let us remove those materials without damaging the paint, without causing more tide lines. Those are those really dark lines, you know, that look like pools or puddles around uh, around these different hieroglyphs. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't damaging the, the protein binder, you know, as we were cleaning. And we also wanted to make sure that we weren't pushing soil materials down into the porous structure of the paint. So we had a lot of different cleaning objectives that we wanted to achieve, you know, in, in um, properly treating this artifact. So one of the things that we used was this material called cyclomethacone D5, and essentially what it let us do was fo uh, form this, this kind of uh, hydrophobic barrier on the surface of the coffin. So we were able to fill the pores of the paint with this solvent material, it's a silicone solvent, so that when we uh, then attacked it with a water-based system, the water wouldn't soak into the paint structure. So essentially what this did was fill up this pore structure and repelled the water so the water could not enter the pore structure of the matte paint and create tide lines or drag soil materials into it. So this is a, a illustration that uh, Chris let us use. Uh, it shows the formation of the liquid hydrophobic barrier. So if this is the surface of the paint layer, you apply the cyclomethacone D5 that soaks into that porous paint structure and fills all of those paint pores. And you have the soil material on the top. Those are those salts or dirt and, or other accretions sitting there on the top. And then when you use your aqueous solution, that aqueous solution just sits right on the surface and interacts with your soil materials and doesn't penetrate below into that paint, which has always been an issue in treating a matte paint, whether they're Egyptian artifacts or not. It's always been a, a problem uh, in creating new tide lines or making the paint, uh, you know, dirty or tinted or saturated in some way by dragging those materials into that pore structure. So the Evalon CR that was also recommended to us was uh, really instrumental. What this essentially is 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 like a really powerful sponge that is is like a, a fabric. So it's kind of doing a, a couple things at once. One one thing that it does is it it pulls soil materials out of the surface. So as soon as you wet this, it kind of acts like a sponge and soaks up those materials and pulls them out of the paint. So it pulls the salt and the dirt and all of those things out away from the surface and they don't get redeposited elsewhere on the surface as a tide line or something like that. The other thing that the Avalon CR did for us is it restricted that aqueous phase so that when you apply the water to the surface, the water doesn't just disperse and spread over the whole surface. Avalon CR let us keep that contained in you know discrete areas that we define you know by either cutting the cloth into a certain shape or using a couple different techniques by lifting the edges of the cloth and things like that to make sure that we were only actually treating the areas we intended to treat. Uh, the other thing that we did, you know, in, in several areas, the preparation layer was extremely unstable, so that material that kind of looks like gesso uh, was crumbling away, and so. In, to avoid introducing polymers and other modern materials uh, that could have could you know in in the future uh, interfere with chemical analysis of the object, we decided to go a different route and we used calcium hydroxide to stabilize uh, the calcium carbonate preparation layer. Essentially, uh, you inject uh, calcium hydroxide particles into the calcium carbonate preparation layer, and over time, it essentially hardens. After a few weeks, it reacts with um, atmospheric oxygen. And C so it essentially it reacts with CO2 and hardens over time. So you don't actually you know, introduce a modern material like a, a polymer like Paraloid B72 or something like that, that when you come back in you know, 100 years can you know, yellow, contract, and then crumble away anyways. This is actually a really kind of wholesome, organic, holistic way of approaching this treatment by using a similar material to the actual material you're treating. Once the, the ground was stabilized, the preparation layer was stabilized so that you could actually approach this and clean it mechanically, uh, we used soft nylon tipped artist brushes and uh, basically uh, HEPA filtered vacuums that have 
a mesh over the top so you don't ac accidentally suck any paint into your vacuum and went through and removed uh, really soiled areas. You can see on the right hand side here we have this beautiful red paint and then obscuring that over the top is this kind of uh, cemented dirt that's over the top of that. So to make our cleaning solutions more effective, our aqueous cleaning solutions more effective, we first cleaned it mechanically in the areas that could actually withstand that. So that mechanical clean is, you know, using things like dental tools or those nylon tip brushes to remove, you know, uh, you know, large volumes of dirt in, in areas just like this. The final step before we actually developed our cleaning solutions was testing the surface pH and the conductivity. Um, Again, since this is more of an Egyptology focused uh, talk, we'll skip some of that chemistry, but uh, we test, we use an agarose plug method, uh, which there's an excellent video on YouTube, which is just down there in the, the right hand corner, if you'd like to take a look at that. But you use an agarose plug uh, to test different areas throughout the coffin to get an idea of what the pH is of the surface. Uh, that's important because generally in conservation, there's kind of a rule of thumb when you're doing this kind of cleaning where you use a solution that's two pH units above the measured pH to start to deprotonate soil materials within your soil layer. So if you measure something that's pH 5.56 on your surface, you can then use a pH 7.5 solution to adequately attack that material and remove it. Or if you measure pH 6, then you can use a pH 8 so that you don't use an unnecessarily high or unnecessarily low pH to do your cleaning. So in measuring this surface, we found 5.56 to 6 pH throughout, which is what we were expecting to see. That's around the pKa of carboxylic acids and things like that, these kinds of deterioration products that form over time. What we also found was that the conductivity of the surface also is expected because it's a matte paint. The surface conductivity was very low. In some areas, we weren't able to even register conductivity. And in other areas, the highest we saw was around 300 microsiemens, which is the unit of measurement for conductivity, which is very low. But again, the rule of thumb that we use in conservation for conductivity is that 10 times higher than the measured value is generally within the acceptable range of, of, of conductivity of your solution. So you, then you know that if you have from a zero to 300, you can probably use a 3000 microsiemen solution quite safely on the paint without causing any adverse long-term effects. So we use the modular cleaning program, which Chris Tabrutis developed to actually um, design and then make these solutions. We used a buffer called TRIS or TRISMA base um, which has a pKa of around eight. So remember, we measured that, that surface pH to be around six or so. So if we have a pH of a pH of eight and a pKa of eight for our buffer, that's right in the range that we want for our cleaning solution. Uh, so what we did here, instead of using something like hydrochloric acid as the acid to form our buffer, we actually ended up using citric acid um, to react with the tris base to form our buffer. And that essentially allowed us to reduce the number of components in the system, which is always a good thing. Uh, keeping the number of variables down is always good in this kind of treatment. So we used uh, citric acid to work one as an acid and then also work as a chelator. At a pH of eight, all three of citric acid's uh, chelation sites are available to actually bond. It's what's called a tridentate uh, chelator, which means tridentate it has three teeth. So it has three places where it can bond with some type of soil material, a metal ion, and remove it from the surface in an aqueous solution. So our citric acid was doing a couple of things there. It was allowing us to form our buffer system and also working as an effective chelator. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to be conscious of when working with these matte, matte pigments that are, or matte based paints that are just very loosely bound pigments. Uh, is that we wanted to make sure that we weren't removing the removing the pigment or uh, you know adversely affecting it. So we wanted to avoid things like EDTA or DTPA, which have you know really high binding constants or binding affinities for what are called the three D transition metals, which is what really gives the 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 blue and the red and the yellow their colors. So we wanted to stay away from those just in case they might affect them negatively. So that was you know another reason we chose citric acid. So the two solutions that we we ended up on. One is the actual cleaning solution. So that is our tris and citric acid system at a malaria 0 0.05. That's just our, our concentration for that system. And then the other thing that we developed was, you know, the, the proper clearance solution. 
when you work with these kinds of systems, you know, if you have something like citric acid and triz, those are solids. You don't want to leave a solid behind in your surface. So you, you clean it. Uh, you don't want to allow that to form a solid in the surface or precipitate on the surface. So you need to be able to clear those solids off the surface after cleaning. So we also uh, made a clearance solution, which is an ammonium acetate clearance solution. So that's a mixture of glacial acetic acid and ammonium hydroxide. And we uh, made we pH adjust or conductivity adjusted that to about a thousand microsiemens, and then pH adjusted that to about pH eight to match our cleaning solution. So then we could go in afterwards and make sure that there were no residues left in the surface from our cleaning solution. That was one of the goals that we set at the beginning was not to adversely affect this by leaving behind residues and other materials that can cause deterioration in the future or mess up any kind of uh, chemical characterization later on. Uh, one of the other things that we did was, you know, of course, we, we um, conductivity adjusted the Tris citric acid solution. So essentially what we did is we um, used um, deionized water to dilute the Tris citric acid sol solution that was at 0 0.05 molarity down to 1000 microsiemens. So that is within that acceptable range of conductivity so we can appropriately clean the surface. The cleaning technique evolved over a period of about um, six months or so. Um, I'm including this just to kind of give an idea of, of the type of, of care and uh, essentially artistic ability that goes into cleaning these kinds of, of objects. Uh, one of the things that you have to be very careful with with these is, is uh, avoiding hieroglyphs. Uh, you want to make sure that you aren't accidentally chelating and, and pulling out the, the materials that make up the actual border of the, border of the hieroglyphs. So, uh, you know, as we did this, we would actually cut around the hieroglyphs. We would cut our Evalon CR so that they would essentially fit in or around hieroglyphs. Um, we would also apply the solution to the Evalon CR before applying it to the object in a separate container to control dispersion of the solution. And we can see, we'll see a video of that later. That was really a critical step to control tide lines. Uh, one of the things that we found and when talking with our colleagues what what they had also found is that when you apply liquids to these kinds of matte paint surfaces um, when the water starts to spread out over the surface it carries the soil material with it and then deposits it on the outer edge and forms new tide lines and that was one of the things that we wanted to avoid initially with this project so applying water our cleaning solution to our Avalon CR cloth outside of the project, outside away from the surface, allow that material to disperse within the cloth and let us put it onto the surface so that essentially the liquid is stationary at that moment. It's not moving or uh, soiling materials around with it as it disperses across the surface. So this is what that actually looks like on this on this last slide. This is actually the cyclomethacone D5 that that solvent soaking into the surface, which is quite scary the first time you do it because it looks like you've just ruined everything. But it just it soaks into the surface here and it actually fully evaporates over time and it actually turns you know right back to the original color. So this is the first step where you're you're forming that liquid hydrophobic barrier. Then after that, you apply uh, your Avalon CR. This is just a dry sheet just to show you know, what that looks like. And this is kind of a square rectangular area, so it's not cut to fit any hieroglyphs or anything like that. But essentially, it's applied to the surface and allowed to sit on the surface for a period of you know, five to 10 minutes or something you know, along those lines. And you want to make sure that the cloth is in contact with the surface at all times. So you can actually use your gloved fingertip to slightly roll the cloth uh, against the surface, or you can actually use the bulb end of a pipette to gently roll it across to make sure that the, the cloth is contacting the painted surface. And what you see here in this, this photo is the, the cleaning solution and the Evalon CR working together to pull soil and materials away from the surface. So all of this material you, you see here are things like pollutants and salts and that kind of stuff that you're trying to pull away from that surface. You can see it absorbing up into the cloth. Once that was done and you've removed as much soil material as you can, you then repeat that procedure, but instead of using the cleaning solution, you use your clearance solution to make sure you remove any residues from the cleaning solution so that you don't leave anything behind and you follow the exact same procedure. One final thing is that, you know, in these treatments, instead of using something like Evalon CR, you know, rigid gels are often used to try to clean these, uh, these objects. Uh, what I found was that the Avalon CR really heavily outperformed these just because uh, a lot of these gels are so rigid that they don't conform to the surface of the object. 
The other thing is that they also tend to kind of form this kind of uh, this this suction that occurs, which essentially is due to it's essentially due to, to gravity, but it essentially acts like a suction cup on the surface. So if you're not careful, it can actually lift paint off the surface. So we avoided gels and we just stuck with the Evalon CR. So this is actually the cleaning process, and it's it's sped up quite a bit here. But that's the application of the cyclomethicone D5, and you can see it dispersing across the surface here over that salt area. Then the saturated uh, Evalon CR is applied. This was just done as a rectangular sheet uh, as a test, but you can see how the, the soil just absorbs right up into that cloth. Then you very slowly peel it from the surface. This is actually a sped up video there. That actually, I would do that over a period of about a minute where I would very carefully peel it off the surface. We'll go through and watch it one more time, but so you can see cyclomethicone goes on first, then you're having one CR with your cleaning solution, then you take that cloth off and you repeat that process with your clearance solution. So it's actually, you know, it's not too difficult of a procedure, but to arrive at a simple procedure, it takes a huge amount of uh, technical work, materials analysis, and a careful research. So you can see there that the cloth comes off and you can see all of the soil materials right there on the surface. And so these are just some still photos of it. And I promise we're almost at the end if anyone has fallen asleep by this point. So this is the Evalon CR with some of those soiling materials absorbed up into the cloth. This is a, a really large area. So, you know, once you get a little more confident, some of the, the more the, the flatter areas that are just, you know, background paint, essentially, you can do in larger strips. And you can see how those materials just absorb right up into the cloth. And then in certain areas, you have to come back that are really soiled with salts and things like that and really target those. I mean, you can see here, I'll circle it with my mouse, but you can see this is kind of that ring, that tide line. And you can see it absorbing you know, perfectly right up into the cloth there. And some, some nice gross material showing that the material, that soil material has been removed. So these are just you know a few results of some some um, little spots uh, that are you know kind of the worst ones uh, throughout that that we we saw in the project. So you can see you know how disfiguring those salts are, and not only are they disfiguring uh, aesthetically, but they also accelerate the deterioration of the object. So you know there's are several important reasons to remove those, but you can see you know how nicely those salts are removed. Uh, this is actually the rim of the coffin uh, where the the lid rests on it. I mean, you can actually see one of the, my favorite things here was that after removing all these soil materials, you were actually able to see uh, much more clearly the marks from the saw, the saw that sawed this lumber. You can actually see the marks from the saw teeth here in the surface where you weren't able to see those before. So one of the, the really wonderful benefits of this was actually being able to see, you know, pieces of the hieroglyphs or um, tool marks from the making of the coffin that weren't visible before, that were now coming to the surface now that they weren't covered in dirt and debris and salt and those kinds of accretions. And finally, you know, at the very end of the project, we started to, to crack into to what are called nanostructured fluids or microemulsions, and this was really at the very end of this project. And you know, at the beginning, we we had kind of hypothesized. I say we; it was my fault. I said we, we should avoid EDTA because we don't want to bind any iron or copper or anything like that. It turned out that that was you know uh, not really uh, a valid concern in this situation. The EDTA as a chelator actually worked very nicely um, within this microemulsion system. And essentially, uh, what what we used here was a pH eight point five buffer. So similar to our Tris buffer, we used one called Bicene. And we did that at a slightly higher pH with this different chelator. And we also used something called triethanolamine, uh, along with a, a surfactant called sulfonic JLADX, and 1% and of, of gam salt, which is essentially like mineral spirits. And you know, if you're a painter, you've probably used mineral spirits to clean your paintbrushes. So we actually formed this microemulsion system um, with the triethanolamine acting, in this case, uh, as a, a co-solvent or a co-surfactant to basically add flexibility to my cells. But this isn't a microemulsion talk, so we can skip over that. But what we found was that using microemulsions, uh, it was actually a more effective cleaning system. Uh, you can see here this, this area uh, on the coffin that was really heavily soiled. Uh, in this small uh, test piece here, you can see how well 
that pulled out all of those soils uh, using this different uh, technique. So just wanted to mention that, you know, there are different ways to approach this, and this is one of them. One thing that still needs to happen with this is that it needs to undergo a little bit of further testing to make sure that there are no surfactant residues left behind from that microemulsion system. Um, but it's, it's really quite promising uh, when you follow that proper clearance procedure that we talked about earlier. Um, this might be a, a really excellent way to tackle matte paint as well. So these, these water-based systems uh, can work really nicely with matte paint objects. Um, you just have to be uh, really diligent in the way you cycle methicone D5 to form hydrophobic uh, barriers and clear things you know, uh, very consciously. If anyone is still alive or awake, uh, there are a lot of people that you know, we, we wanted to thank uh, for their help in this project. Uh, one person is, is in the audience, uh, Leah Humphrey uh, came by one day and uh, translated a lot of hieroglyphs for me and really provided a lot of extra insight. And of course, uh, my partner in this project, Dr. Odegaard, um, RC was you know, the, the main uh, grant funder in this project. So a big thank you to RC and RCAZ. Whether you knew it or not, you helped fund this project. So thank you very much for doing that and the Institute of Archaeological uh, Research and Discovery. All right, so did everybody get all that? Are you ready for the pop quiz? Thank you so much, Luke. We really appreciated that lecture. That was really interesting. Um, so what we'd like to do now is invite anyone to ask any questions, if you're okay with that, Luke. Oh yeah, absolutely. Great, so if anybody would like to ask questions, please feel free to send them through the chat and um, I can read them or Tracy can read them. Um, or if you would like, you can uh, unmute yourself and also ask Luke a question directly. Yeah, and you know, while, while we're waiting, um, you know, I I really wanna say thank you to, to RC Arizona for inviting me to talk about this often. You know, the, the conservation side and the um, art historical and Egyptology side, you know, don't don't talk enough. So I think this, it's it's really nice to be able to, to bridge the gap and kind of, you know, give give people an insight or a glimpse into what we do kind of on a daily basis and, you know, how we approach these objects. Um, you know, a lot of folks still look at conservation uh, as restoration and things have really you know changed in the last uh, couple of decades. So, you know, when we approach these projects as conservators, we, we put a lot of care, focus, and, and attention into it uh, to make sure we can provide the best treatments possible. So I have a question, Luke, actually, if, you, if I can go first. Yeah. Um, I might have asked you this before, in which case I apologize, but I was wondering if, like, how do you know how much of the cyclomethicone D5 that you can apply? Like, is there a danger of it oversaturating a certain area? And then if so, can that harm the coffin? That's actually an amazing question. So one of the, the, the really incredible things about cyclomethicone D5 is that it is, it is essentially impossible to oversaturate an area um, if you're not doing something absolutely wild, like soaking it, you know, like filling a bathtub with it and, and throwing the thing in there. Uh, when you apply it to the surface via pipette, uh, you're applying, you know, just singular droplets over the surface, then they disperse very nicely and fill that pore structure. And so with the cyclomethicone D5, um, you know, because it has such low polarity, it, it doesn't interact with a lot of the other materials that exist within that paint matrix. So whether it's soy materials or um, actual, you know, paint particles, things like that, it doesn't interact with those. It just fills in the cavities. So it just spreads out really nicely and fills those. And it kind of like self levels itself. So it keeps dispersing until, it, you know, there's a nice level surface. So there's no danger in, in oversaturating. And the other great thing about it is that it's totally volatile, which means it, it completely evaporates over a period, um, what I found over a period of about 24 hours. So it totally evaporates from the surface and doesn't leave any trace behind. And that's been tested um, uh, in a few different papers. They, were, they showed that there were no uh, residues left by cyclomethicone D5. That's great. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, I see some additional questions coming in now. Um, so one of the questions um, from G, uh, BGF1 is why was the coffin sawed in half? That's a great question. I, I wish I knew. 
Um, there are some guesses, but they're really just, you know, kind of wild hypotheses at this point. Um, what we know is that um, the, when the coffin uh, left Egypt, it went into um, a private collection that belonged to an Egyptian woman, I believe in Sweden, and um, we're not sure how it got there. Um, so one of the thoughts was that, you know, perhaps it was sawed in half so that it could, it could be stacked really discreetly and taken out of the uh, out of Egypt that way. Um, there was a guess that it could have been sawed in half when it was taken out of the tomb. It came from a rock cut tomb. So there's a, a, a small, vert, from what we know, there was a small vertical shaft leading into the tomb. So they thought maybe they cut it in half to get it out of the tomb because they didn't go in through the original entrance. They went in through, they went in a different way. So there's, there was some thought with that, but you know, really, I don't know, uh, just a few guesses. So another question from Anjali Jane is, uh, thank you for the interesting talk, Luke. And then uh, were there any loose paint particles that were vulnerable to being picked up while mechanical or aqueous cleaning? And how did you prevent this from happening? Yeah, that's a constant threat and one of the most difficult parts of this treatment. This treatment uh, took about a year. And that was that's not including you know the research. Um, so it, it's very painstaking uh, treatment. So you know the loose paint particles were really a, a constant issue. Uh, for mechanical cleaning, it's it's simple. You just avoid those areas where it, it seems too loose and it just seems dangerous. You know you'll you'll notice that if you're breathing around it and you start to see particles starting to move and things like that. So you just tend to avoid those areas or you go in first and you stabilize those areas. So that callosil that we talked about earlier that stabilizes the preparation layer also stabilizes the paint attached to that pre preparation layer. So you can lay down large areas with that and make sure it's well adhered to the coffin. The other thing that we did, and we didn't really talk about it too much in this, this talk, um, was that you know because the binding media within the paint, the thing that holds it all together was a protein, an animal-based protein glue. When we went through with the cleaning solution, the aqueous cleaning solution, which is, you know, 98% water, maybe more, the water in that solution was actually reactivating the original binding media. So it was essentially re-gluing itself down to the surface as I cleaned it. So you would work on an area that was a little loose, you would clean it, and then you would come back the next day and it's well adhered, which is really one of the beauties and one of the reasons we wanted to identify that, that animal protein glue. So we, you could design an effective way to actually re-adhere that. And that was actually all uh, Dr. Odegaard's idea, the, this idea of reactivating that original animal protein. And what we had originally thought to do was a technique where you use actually a, a nebulizer with kind of you know warm deionized water and build essentially a humidity chamber to introduce humidity really gently to the object to reapply that paint to re-adhere that paint to the surface. But we found that through contact with the aqueous solution, that was more than adequate to reactivate it and re-adhere it. If anybody else has any additional questions, please feel free to ask unmuted if you like or via chat while we're waiting just to see i actually have one another question if you don't mind yeah of course um i was wondering um how many linen uh remnants were found on the coffin and if it was on one specific side or on multiple sides yeah so um what it looked like uh when you when you look at the coffin so the, the front with the wujat eyes and then there's there's the back what it looked like is that the mummy had tilted towards the back. So essentially the, the shoulder um, and side was, was touching the back of the coffin. So, you know, this is, this is the middle kingdom and the way uh, uh, bodies were interred in coffins was, was a bit different. So th they were actually buried on their side and their eyes were lined up with the Wujat eyes. So they were actually kind of on their side. So over time you could slump forward or backwards in the coffin. And so uh, Noct had, had slumped backwards. And so when uh, the, the mummy was removed from the coffin, there were fragments essentially all along that back side. So there's, there's a section that was maybe about three feet long or so that had fragments kind of all over the place. 
Uh, that one that I showed a picture of was the one that was most intact, but they were, you know, pretty pretty much along that entire back side. Uh, I didn't catch that. Shima, uh, did you, if you asked the question, maybe could you repeat it again or also type it if that's more convenient? Um, just to respond to one thing in, in the chat, um, Namita, about the, the calisil. Uh, one thing is that you have to make sure you have very small sized um, diameter nanoparticles. So if you're working with calisil and you're working with finer art objects, which I know you tend to work with, um, try the calcium hydroxide particles from Piero Baglioni's group, Nano Restart. They have a much smaller diameter, so they're much smaller particle size, and they'll work much better with those smaller particles um, that, that you're tending to work with. Uh, in this in this particular project, you know some of the particles are you know very large, so the calisil that I I was using was you know more than sufficient, but those those calcium hydroxide particles from Nano Restart would would probably work better for for you. Um, if there's any additional questions, I don't see any more in the chat. Um, it's a lot of information to to absorb and even think about. Well, what it was all very interesting, and I think it gives us all a lot to think about that maybe if we're Egyptology people, we don't always think of necessarily the conservation side. At least it's not something that I've always thought of in great detail. So I really appreciate hearing this. Yeah, and you know, uh, it, it's the same for us. You know, the insights that we get from our colleagues in Egyptology um, you know, to, to identify what's important, what's, you know, what's significant. Um, you know, I didn't even know where Knox's name was on the coffin until you had stopped by. And so, you know, when you learn things like that, well, then it's a lot easier to pay a little more attention to those areas when you're treating them, you know, or, you know, you learn what's important and, you know, what's not when you're going through the process of treating, which is, you know, you always have to make those decisions. You know, there isn't unlimited time and money for these kinds of projects. So, you know, it's always great to have, you know, have everybody come together and work on these projects. Absolutely. Um, so I don't know if, uh, Tracy, if you have any final words that you'd like to make. Um, I do not really have any final words, but I really wanted to thank Luke for a very interesting lecture. And for him being the first person to do an online Zoom lecture for RC Arizona, um, we are looking forward to getting everybody back together and to be able to see so many of our members here this evening was really very exciting for me. Um, I look forward to seeing everybody together in the future. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, you know, I really in enjoyed speaking with everyone. They're excellent questions. Uh, I appreciate Great that job, people Luke. give their time on a Sunday evening to listen to someone talk about conservation chemistry. Thank you so much, Luke. We really appreciated it. Of course. Have a wonderful week, everybody. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Take care.